This month is my most requested serial killer yet. As you can see in the title, we're talking about Ted Bundy, who is probably one of the most famous or the most talked about serial killers of all time. Ted Bundy is thought to have killed 36 women, but this may be a lot, lot higher. Authorities have never been 100% sure exactly how many people he killed. We don't even think Ted knew exactly how many people he killed. He would play games with the authorities, sometimes saying that 36 was the correct number, sometimes saying that if you add one extra digit on that, you might be closer. We don't even think he knew. Ted Bundy was a striking contrast to the usual serial killer stereotype of the time. He wasn't a loner who would hide away in dark rooms. He was charming, good looking, charismatic. He got on well with everyone, he had friends. People liked him, he fitted in. And he was the perfect predator. He was born Robert Theodore Cowell on November 24th, 1946 at the Elizabeth Lund unwed home for mothers in Burlington, Vermont to his mother, Eleanor Louise Cowell, or she was mostly known to people as just Louise. Louise had been sent to the home for unwed mothers by her parents, Samuel and Eleanor Cowell, because she was unwed and she was pregnant. They were ashamed of her, so they sent her off. When she returns after three months, her parents take Ted and raise him as their own, and he grew up believing that his mother was his older sister. He didn't find out his true parentage for many, many years. His aunt slash sister one day recalled that she was having a nap and she woke up after this nap to find herself surrounded by knives. A three-year-old little Ted stood next to her smiling. People love to tell this story because obviously it shows that he had these murderous tendencies from a young age. Maybe he did or maybe he was just being a toddler. There's been many rumours over the years as to who Ted's real father is and the most prevalent rumour of all these is that his father is actually his grandfather, Louise's dad Samuel, who reportedly raped her. It's worth saying that there isn't much basis in this rumour, it is literally just a very, very strong rumour that's gone throughout the years, and Louise always said that the father was just this random guy. On Ted's birth certificate, it actually says that his father was an Air Force veteran called Lloyd Marshall, but Louise changed this story many times over the years. She never got the story straight. Throughout his life, Ted actually spoke pretty warmly about his grandparents, particularly his grandfather. His grandmother, Eleanor, was a shy, timid woman. She had depression and agoraphobia. She rarely, rarely left the house. But his grandfather, Samuel, was a violent and abusive man. But Ted said that he very much respected his grandfather and clung on to him as a child. But other family members, other people who knew him, said that Samuel was a tyrannical bully. He was a racist, he would regularly beat up his wife, he would physically abuse the neighbourhood animals. This just wasn't a good guy and he was said to have mental issues himself, apparently just talking to himself to thin air all the time. It's not known exactly when Ted found out the truth about his actual parentage. Some sources say that a cousin called him a bastard when he was younger and then showed him his birth certificate. Some say that Ted went searching for his birth certificate when he was a bit older. True crime writer Anne Rule, who actually knew Ted personally, said that he didn't find out about his true parentage until 1969, when he would have been in his early 20s. Apparently he went hunting for his original birth records in Vermont and obviously found out that Louise was his mother. He had a lot of deep-rooted issues about his parentage. It was a huge, huge source of shame for him. He would refer to himself as illegitimate, as a bastard, and he really resented his mother hugely for never ever telling him. And he would go on to blame his mother for his killing spree, saying that the reason he did all this is because she never told him the truth. But I failed to see how he's quite putting that together here. In 1951, when Ted was actually four years old, Louise packs up and moves to Tacoma, Washington to live with her cousins. And she takes Ted with her. Now this is a bit strange to me because she moved away with Ted, but she still didn't tell him that she was his mother. So she must have taken him away and raised him, still saying to him that, hey, I'm your older sister, I'm not your mother. Maybe it was a deep-rooted shame within her, or maybe her parents had some kind of control over her. But I do find it quite, quite strange that even though she moved him to the other side of the country, she still didn't tell him that she was his mother. Whilst in Washington, Louise meets a man called Johnny Bundy and she marries him, they go on to have four more children and Johnny actually adopts Ted and so his name becomes Ted Bundy. 
And Ted would later say that he never felt like a Bundy. The name never sat right with him. He was always a cowl at heart. With Ted now being the oldest of five children in the house, his parents didn't give him the attention that he desired. He kind of just flew under the radar. The Bundy house was small and cramped and Ted struggled to fit in with his siblings. First of all, you, as I understand it, were raised in what you considered to have been a healthy home. Absolutely. You were not physically abused. You were not sexually abused. You were not emotionally abused. No, no way. I, and that's part of the tragedy of this whole situation is because uh, I grew up in a wonderful home with two dedicated and loving parents and one of uh, five brothers and sisters. Now there's conflicting reports as to what his school life was like but it seems most likely that he was very popular and intelligent during his first few years of school and then he attended Woodrow Wilson High School in Tacoma and he became slightly more withdrawn. He had no sense of how to develop friendships, he didn't understand what made people want to be friends and he said that he really felt this during his time at high school but classmates actually came forward over the years and said that he was a well-liked guy, he was popular. So even though he didn't actually understand why or how to make friends, people still liked him and they actually referred to him as a medium-sized fish in a large pond. So he wasn't that loner guy who sat at the back of the class not making friendships or not talking to anybody. He was involved, he did speak to people. You've got to remember that he was just naturally charismatic. He just had this thing about him which made people like him. So even though he didn't get friendships, he didn't ever let this show to anybody. Throughout high school, he was arrested a couple of times for burglary and auto theft. He later said that because he didn't get any attention at home and he sort of didn't have any way of getting things, he would just go out and steal things for himself, a theme that would go on throughout most of his life. And this is where it started. But of course, because Ted was minor when he turned 18, as by Washington state law, his record was wiped clean. It seems that Ted really came to his own when he graduated high school and started university. He went to University of Puget Sound in 1965. Now when Ted first moved to Tacoma, he was really lacking in that male role model, the thing he admired so much in his grandfather. And so he began to seek it out in his great uncle, Jack Cowell. Now Jack Cowell was a wealthy piano teacher who lived on the fancy side of town. And Ted wanted to be just like his uncle, and his uncle was a teacher at the University of Puget Sound, and so that's where Ted wanted to go. Now it's worth putting in here that on the 31st of August 1961, there was actually an eight-year-old student of Jack Cowles who went missing, Anne-Marie Burr. She lived just blocks away from Jack, and she went missing in the middle of the night. She was eight years old. Her mother said that she locked the door before they went to sleep, and in the morning she came down and the door was unlocked, and there was a small male footprint outside the front of the door, and Anne-Marie was gone. Anne-Marie's body was never found, and Ted completely denied having anything to do with her disappearance. He would have been only 14 at the time. However, shortly before his execution, he actually made a few comments about her, but it didn't exactly clear the air, nothing he said led them to finding her, and he did like to play games. He would confess to all these murders to put off his execution, and so it's very likely that maybe he didn't kill Anne-Marie and he was just saying it either to mess with the authorities or to stop his execution. Um, we'll never know if Ted Bundy had anything to do with the disappearance of Anne-Marie Burr, I know her family think that he did. Unless a body's ever found, I find it highly unlikely that we'll ever actually know a conclusive answer to this. A DNA test was done in 2011, but it came back as inconclusive, and Anne-Marie's case actually remains open today. Ted spent one year enrolled at the University of Puget Sound before he decided to transfer to the University of Washington in 1966 to study, of all things, Chinese. Now, Ted actually really struggled at university. His ego was telling him that he was the smartest person in every room, he was the best at everything. He had this god complex but he went to university and he realised that he just wasn't as smart as he thought he was. The reality was that he was just of average intelligence and Chinese was really hard to study. Whilst at the University of Washington, Ted meets a girl. He meets Stephanie Brooks, a really, really pretty, petite girl with dark hair parted down the middle. In 1968 though, Ted actually drops out of university and he starts to bounce around a variety of minimum wage jobs. But he also volunteers at the Seattle office of Nelson Rockefeller's Republican presidential campaign. And this actually leads him to attend the Republican National Convention later that year. 
But Stephanie actually ends their relationship around this time, and this is believed to be one of the most pivotal moments in Ted's development, one of the main things that led to him becoming who he became. And Stephanie apparently was just frustrated with him, Ted had no drive, no motivation, no ambition and she just didn't want to be with somebody like that. Stephanie came from a very wealthy background, she had ambitions, she was going to go far in life and Ted just wasn't. It's not really known whether Ted had actual feelings for this girl, whether it was even possible for him to have feelings towards anyone, or if Ted saw her as a stepping stone in his life plan. But either way, when she ended things with him, he was devastated. But it also seems likely that it was around this time that he discovered his true parentage, is when he visited Vermont and probably looked at his birth records at the Elizabeth Lund home. And this would have obviously led to further upset and it caused him major shame. Now obviously for most people this would be a shock, finding out that your sister is actually your mother and your parents who you thought were your parents were actually your grandparents. Like that's gonna confuse anybody. But it's not going to lead most people to become a serial killer as Ted did. Ted was openly devastated by Stephanie ending their relationship, but it leads to a complete change in his demeanour, a complete change in who he was. He became more focused and more ambitious, and he probably put in an effort to become more ambitious just to prove Stephanie wrong here. In 1969, he meets Elizabeth Klepfer, who was a divorcee, and they go on to have an on and off relationship for many, many years, continuing well into his killing spree. In 1970, he re-enrolls at the University of Washington, at this time as a psychology major, and he quickly becomes an honours student, and he's well liked by his professor, by other students. He was sort of like just top of the class in every single way. He's popular and successful, and then in 1971, he actually takes a job at Seattle's Suicide Hotline Crisis Centre, which seems an unlikely job for a serial killer to be. But on a daily basis, he would talk to people on the phone and talk them down from committing suicide. It's at this job that he meets Anne Rule, who went on to write The Stranger Beside Me, which is probably the most famous Ted Bundy book of all time. And Anne Rule wrote in her book that she liked Ted immediately. She said, it would have been hard not to. He bought me a cup of coffee and he waved his arm over the awesome banks of phone lines. Now Anne was an aspiring true crime writer at this time and she was an ex-police officer. If anybody was going to pick up on anything strange about Ted Bundy, she would be that person. But she said there just wasn't anything strange about him. He was genuinely a good, nice guy. She noted his physical attractiveness and said at the time that if she was younger, if her daughters were older, he would have made the perfect husband, the perfect boyfriend. And it's this physical attractiveness that so many people cling on to when they talk about Ted Bundy that made him be able to murder with such ease for so many years because nobody really suspects the good looking guy in the corner. Although I do want to say, just as a matter of personal opinion here, that I don't see that Ted Bundy is attractive. I don't look at him and think, oh, he's really, really good looking. He's just kind of an average looking guy. He's not ugly, but he's definitely not the best looking person you're ever going to see in your life. I just think that people cling on to his physical attractiveness because in terms of serial killers, he's quite good looking. In terms of most male population, average at best. In 1972, Ted finally graduates from the University of Washington with a bachelor's degree in psychology. And the following year, he's hired as assistant to the chairman of the Washington State Republican Party. In the autumn, he gets accepted to the law schools at the University of Puget Sound and the University of Utah, choosing to attend the University of Puget Sound for the second time. This new, ambitious, motivated, successful Ted Bundy begins dating Stephanie Brooks for a second time, who can see that Ted is now on the brink of a very successful career, either in law or politics. All her worries about this previously unmotivated man are now gone, and he actually continues dating Elizabeth while he's dating Stephanie, and neither woman ever finds out about the other. But Ted and Stephanie get serious fast, and Ted even begins saying to Stephanie that he's going to marry her, begins introducing her to people as his fiancée, everything is looking really good for the two of them. 
But then one day in January 1974, he suddenly breaks off all contact with Stephanie. No reason why, he just stops talking to her. He refused to answer any letters or phone calls. It was just completely without explanation. And a month later, Stephanie finally gets hold of him and asks him why he broke off their relationship so suddenly. And he simply replies in a calm, monotonous voice, Stephanie, I have no idea what you mean. And then hangs up. And she never hears from him again. Years later, he said that he got back together with her pretty much out of spite. He wanted to prove that he could, that he was good enough and that he could have her if he wanted her. And Stephanie said that she believed that him sort of suddenly breaking off their engagement was vengeance in a way for her breaking up with him all those years earlier. He wanted to prove a point and he did it. Stephanie breaking up with him all those years earlier had really dented his ego in a way and therefore he had to prove to himself that he could be the person who could get her back. So he did it and then that was enough for him. In April 1974, Ted actually drops out of law school after spending months skipping classes. Now Ted's actually working in the emergency services in the Seattle area, working for the Seattle Crime Prevention Advisory Commission. Ironically, he even wrote a pamphlet at one point that was all about rape prevention. Now, nobody knows for sure when Ted Bundy started killing. He's told different stories over the years to various different people, and he's always refused to speak about the specifics of some of his earliest crimes. And also, I want to note before I start talking in depth about the victims, that a lot of the victims are known as aliases, so the names I'm gonna be telling you aren't necessarily their real names. Some of them are, some of them aren't. Um, and it's mainly to protect their family's identities. So you may see some of these people I'm gonna talk about referred to as other names in different sources. The first crime that we 100% know of and can be attributed to Ted Bundy was the sexual assault and attempted murder of 18 year old Karen Sparks on January 4th, 1974. So around the time that he ended his relationship with Stephanie. Ted had been a peeping Tom for a while. Since his teenage years, he would stand there watching girls through the windows, just getting his rocks off. And then one day something just clicks within him and he crosses that line. He crosses the line from just watching to actually entering. He randomly decides to enter the home of Karen Sparks who he'd been watching through her window. We don't think it was planned in any way, just something just clicked within him. He breaks into her basement apartment and bludgeons her unconscious with a metal rod that he took from her bed frame before sexually assaulting her with this same rod. And this caused massive internal injuries for her. When she's found, she's taken to hospital where she remains unconscious for 10 days, but ultimately she does survive. But then his first recorded murder takes place less than one month later on February 1st. Linda Ann Healy was 21 years old and she attended the University of Washington. She was a slim, beautiful girl with brunette hair parted down the middle and bright blue eyes. On February 1st, Linda actually fails to turn up for work at the Northwest Ski Reports where she would give ski reports over the radio. Now, she was a very responsible employee. She would always turn up on time, so it was very concerning when she wasn't there. And then she also failed to turn up for dinner with her parents that evening and that's when they knew for sure that something was wrong. Her parents call the police to immediately go to Linda's home to investigate and she shared her home with housemate. The police enter Linda's bedroom and find it covered in blood. It was quite obvious that something bad had happened here. There was dried blood on the pillow and her nightgown was actually neatly hung up in her closet. Her nightgown was also covered in blood so she would have been wearing it when she was attacked. Someone had carefully undressed her and then redressed her again in her day clothes and then taken her from the house without making a sound because her housemate, who was in the entire time, didn't hear a thing. At some point in the night, Ted had managed to sneak into the home, beat her unconscious, likely rape and murder her, redress her and remove her body from the home without anyone hearing a thing. When Ted finally confessed years later, he said they actually found the front door unlocked and open, which is highly unlikely because Linda's housemate actually said that they'd made a great effort to make sure the door was locked because of the attack on Karen Sparks just a month earlier. He gagged her and carried her to the back seat of his car where he covered her with a blanket and drove to a secluded location. It's likely that while she was still asleep in bed, he'd hit her around the head with a crowbar and she was probably just holding on to her last bit of life when he took her out of the house. Linda's skull and mandible were found in March 1975 at Taylor Mountain. In the first half of 1975, female university students were disappearing at an alarming rate, like one a month. 
The next was Donna Manson on March 12th, who Ted confessed to murdering in 1989 whilst on death row. Donna definitely fits in with everything we know about Ted's victim. She was young, she was beautiful, she had dark hair which she wore in a centre parting and she'd actually left her dorm to go to a jazz concert but she never arrived. It's likely that her remains were found years after by fishermen at Taylor Mountain because her remains were found near a multicoloured top um, which she was probably wearing on the day she disappeared. However, DNA testing couldn't confirm this. So although it's likely they found Donna's body, we don't know 100% and a lot of people do question as to whether Donna was one of Ted's victims or not. The only thing that we could possibly cover that may add to some of the answers is a location of Donna Manson because she's the one that's missing and we never found anything we think is her at all. I don't want to beat her the bush with you anymore. I'm just tired and I just want to get back and go to sleep. Okay. So let me just tell you, I, the head, however, the skull, it wouldn't be there. Where is it? It's nowhere. It's nowhere? It's, it's in a category by itself. Now I just assume this was something that you just kept but I can see the headlines now. Ted, there's not going to be any details. What, what you told me about Georgia and Hawkins isn't going to be known. I got parents out there that don't even want to know the details. Well, I know. Yeah, well it was incinerated. It was incinerated. April 17th, Susan Elaine Rancourt disappears. Now she was slightly different from the rest of the girls because she actually had blonde hair. Um, she was walking to a meeting with her advisor at Central Washington College where she left at 9 p.m. and she was actually walking to see a German film with her friends but she never arrives. Investigators found her brutally fractured skull years later when they excavated Taylor Mountain and Ted confessed to her murder before his execution. After the disappearance of Susan, a couple of female students came forward saying they'd actually seen a man standing nearby in a sling who was asking girls to help him carry books to his car, a Volkswagen Beetle. And this was Ted's usual MO. He would wear his arm in a sling or a leg in a cast or he'd have crutches. And he'd basically ask vulnerable girls for help. And they would see this charming, good looking man in distress and a lot of them would jump at the chance to help him. Only when they got over to his car, he would usually hit them around the head with a weapon, usually a crowbar, and then hide them in the front of his car where he would have removed his front passenger seat and placed it on the back seat. This enabled him to have an empty space on the floor of his car where he could lay his victims, cover them with a blanket, and nobody would suspect a thing. On May 6th, Roberta Parks leaves her Oregon State University dorm to have coffee with friends, and she never arrived. And the police are very concerned at this point because despite there being absolutely no physical evidence, it's very obvious to them that they've got some kind of serial killer, serial offender on their hands. And this serial killer had a very clear modus operandi. His victims were young, attractive, petite, Caucasian females, usually students or from a middle class background. They all had dark hair parted in the middle and they would often wear hoop earrings. Thanks to reports from potential witnesses, police knew they were looking for a good looking man in his mid 20s with dark hair and that's pretty much it. As time went on they slowly learnt more and more about their suspect. They learnt that his facial features were pretty unremarkable, although he was good looking there was nothing distinguishable about his face. But this allowed him to change how he looked and this is why Ted Bundy is so often referred to as a chameleon. He could easily blend into his surroundings by just growing facial hair or wearing a hat. He could completely change his entire appearance. People wouldn't recognise him at all. When he wasn't using a sling or a fake cast to attract his potential victims, he would dress up as police officers or firefighters, people with authority, and he would use this to gain his victims' trust. And this is just so calculated. This is somebody who knew exactly what he was doing. Everything he did was planned out. As more and more attacks happen, the authorities note further similarities, like most of the girls disappear at night, usually near some kind of construction site, and at every single one there'd been a sighting of a man wearing a sling or a fake cast 
driving a tan Volkswagen Beetle. His initial attacks involved beating women around the head with crowbars before raping them with inanimate objects. Before raping his victims, he would force them to take off their clothes and then he would remove all of his own clothes so there would be no physical evidence left behind. He would then take the clothes and burn them, although in one case he actually put the clothes in a charity bin, which is a little bit strange. Some of his later victims would die by strangulation. He would decapitate them and keep their skulls sometimes in his home for a little while before disposing of them in the mountains. Occasionally he would change how he murdered. There's one girl that he actually drowned in a bathtub. Most of the time he would bludgeon them to death, sometimes strangle, sometimes drowning. He didn't have one clear method of killing. You think Ted Bundy is as creepy as he can possibly get at this point? Well, think again. A lot of the times after he dumped the victims' bodies, he would go back weeks later just to lie with them, engage in necrophilia. Sometimes he would go and wash their hair, paint their nails and apply makeup to their faces. It seems he was making them up to his standards. He was putting them in the clothes and the makeup that he wanted them to wear, but they couldn't fight back. They couldn't assert themselves. He had ultimate control. He had a God complex. He wanted to be in charge all the time. But let's get back to his spree. So the next one happens on June 1st, 1974, when he spotted talking to 22 year old Brenda Ball with his arm in a sling and of course she disappears. 10 days later on June 11th, University of Washington student Georgian Hawkins disappears. Now she actually leaves her boyfriend's dorm and she's walking back to her own home and they live very close together. Literally the walk back is down one brightly lit alleyway. But somehow on this walk she disappeared and nobody saw a thing. Probably closer to 12 on a warm, Seattle May night. I mean, it was, I think it was clear. Weather had been fairly good. Uh, I was moving up the alley using a, uh, a briefcase and some crutches. And a young woman walked down. I saw her round the north end of the block into the alley and stop for a moment and then keep on walking down the alley toward me. And about halfway down the block, I encountered her and asked her to help me carry the briefcase, which she did, and we walked back up the alley. Across the street, turned right on the sidewalk, in front of, I think, the fraternity house on the corner there. Midway in the block, there used to be a parking lot there, dirt, surface, no lights, and my car was parked there. Three homicide detectives and a criminalist combed this alleyway for any sign, any clue, and they found absolutely nothing. Now, witnesses did come forward saying that earlier in the day they'd seen a man on crutches in the alley and he was struggling to carry a briefcase. Apparently, he'd asked another woman to help him carry the case, but she'd refused. Around this point, he meets Carol Ann Boone, who would go on to play a major, major part in his story, so make sure you remember that name. I'm unsure if he started dating Carol at this point or if they just knew each other, but he was actually still seeing Elizabeth at this time. Ted's murders in the Washington area would culminate on July 14th, 1974, with what are often referred to as the Lake Salmon murders. On any warm summer's day, hundreds of people would flock to Lake Sammamish where they would have picnics, play in the water, just spend time with friends. And on that day, Ted Bundy chose it as his hunting spot. He wore a white tennis outfit with a cast around his arm and he walked around introducing himself to people as Ted. He approached many, many young women that day who most of them said he actually put on some kind of accent, maybe Canadian, maybe a poor English accent. They said that he was charming and kind and he was asking for help to unhook his boat from his car. Most of the girls politely refused their spending time with their friends, but one girl, Janice Ott, agreed to help. She walked away with Ted, flirting with him, and she was never seen again. Four hours later, Denise Nasland actually leaves her friends to go to the toilet and she doesn't return. Her friends and her boyfriend wait for hours and she just doesn't come back. So after the park closes, they call the police. Ted later said that Janice was actually still alive when he took Denise and apparently he forced one to watch whilst he murdered the other. But on the night of his execution, he actually recanted this and stated that this wasn't true. On September 6th of that year, so a couple of months later, two hunters actually stumble upon the remains of Janice and Denise near a service road in Issaquah, which was about two miles east of Lake Sammamish. 
as authorities combed the area, they also found some remains of George Ann Hawkins. In August 1974, Ted actually receives a second acceptance from the University of Utah Law School, and so he moves to Salt Lake City, and his murderous tendencies move with him. He would later say that whilst at the University of Utah, he was discovered to learn that other students had something he didn't. They had a greater intellectual capacity, and Ted just wasn't up to the car. And I'm sure this angered him greatly. A new string of murders would begin the month after Ted moved to Utah. He raped and strangled a still unidentified hitchhiker in Idaho on September 2nd. And then on October 2nd, he kidnapped 16 year old Nancy Wilcox. Now Ted said this one was slightly different because he actually only intended to rape and release her in an attempt to de-escalate his pathological urges, but apparently he accidentally strangled her in the process and her remains have never been found. Two weeks later, on October 17th, the 17-year-old daughter of the police chief, Melissa Smith, disappears after leaving a pizza parlour where she'd had dinner with her friends. Now, it's likely that she actually got to about 100 foot away from her home when Ted took her, and her naked body was found in the mountains nine days later. She'd actually been beaten around the head with a crowbar and her body was battered. She'd been strangled with a nylon stocking, raped and sodomised. Her postmortem stated that she was actually probably still alive in the mountains for up to a week after she was put there. She just wasn't strong enough to go and look for help. October 31st, 17 year old Lauren Aim disappears just after midnight. Her body is found in American Fort Canyon on Thanksgiving. She had been abused and murdered in the same way as Melissa. And years later, Ted would actually say that he would go back and shampoo their hair and he'd apply makeup on them and he'd just lie with them for hours. And then comes the beginning stages of Ted Bundy's downfall. So on the afternoon of November 8th, he actually approaches 18 year old Carol DeRonch at Fashion Place Mall in Murray. He introduces himself to her as Officer Rosalind from the Murray Police and says that somebody's tried to break into her car and she needs to come down to the station to file a formal complaint. Now she's unsure at first, but Ted keeps convincing her and eventually she's like, okay. So he puts Carol in his car and they drive away. Only Carol soon realizes that they're not driving towards the police station. As soon as she says this, he grabs her shoulder and attempts to put handcuffs on her as he did with all of his victims. Only in the struggle, he actually puts both cuffs on the same wrist, meaning that Carol is free to open the door and escape. She immediately goes to the police and tells them what's happened. Now later that night, another girl goes missing, 17 year old Deborah Kent. Now she was actually at a theatre production at her school and the school's drama teacher and another witness would later say that they'd seen a man sort of prowling around outside the school and at the back of the auditorium. This man had asked the drama teacher to come out into the car park to identify a car that was there and Deborah just disappeared that night and she was never found. When authorities went to investigate, they actually found a key outside the doors to the auditorium and this key just happened to be the same key that would unlock the handcuffs on Carol Durant's wrist. Around this time, Elizabeth Klepfer, Ted's on and off girlfriend, actually contacts the police for the second time, telling them that she has suspicions about her boyfriend, Ted Bundy. For the majority of his murders in Washington, Ted and Elizabeth actually lived together and she'd begun to put two and two together. His behaviour was just very odd. He was psychologically abusive, always convinced that Elizabeth was cheating on him. Sometimes she'd wake up in the night and Ted would be examining her body with a flashlight to look for signs of cheating. Elizabeth knew that he was acting strangely but didn't know what this meant, didn't know what was actually going on because your first thought isn't serial killer. But Elizabeth started to notice small things, weird things he owned, things that she was pretty sure he wasn't buying so she thought that he was stealing things. She slowly started to realise that Ted was never home on the nights that these girls were disappearing. He would be out all night and then he'd come home and sleep all day. The first time she reported him was actually when they were still living together in Washington, but detectives were receiving up to 200 tips every single day. And so Elizabeth's tip just kind of got swept under the carpet. They thought it was highly unlikely that a clean cut student with no criminal record could be the one committing these murders. Around this time as well though, Anne Rule also reported him to the police because she recognized him from a drawing that had been done of the suspect, but again, it just got brushed away. Elizabeth calls the police again when she notices reports of girls going missing again around Salt Lake City and she knows that it's too much of a coincidence. 
Luckily this time, the police take it a bit more seriously. Ever since the murders at Lake Sammamish, they know that the man they're looking for is likely called Ted. And so when Elizabeth calls up and says like, my boyfriend, Ted Bundy, they think, oh, okay, maybe we're on something here. A detective from the major crime unit actually interviews Elizabeth very, very in detail, and Ted is quickly rising on their list of suspects. However, they call in a witness from Lake Sammamish and they fail to identify him in a lineup. But in December, Elizabeth calls again. She's not letting it go. And although Ted is on their list of suspects, she knows they need to do something more, but they can't link him to anything. But despite all this, the fact that Elizabeth pretty much knew that Ted was the one committing these murders, she stays with him. And I don't know if it was a self-confidence thing with her or if she just wanted to keep tabs on him. If she was in a relationship with him, then she could keep an eye on what he was doing. Um, but obviously he has no idea that she's now reported him to the police three times. I um, mean, January 1975, he comes to visit her in Seattle and then she makes plans to actually come visit him later that year in around August time. Ted goes to visit her again in Seattle around early June and the two actually discuss getting married. But Ted would use this as a way to control her. He would sort of dangle marriage in front of her face and then rip it away. But of course this entire time, Elizabeth doesn't know, but Ted's actually seeing other people. In 1975, possibly knowing that the police are beginning to clock on to him, he actually moves his murders eastward to Colorado. On January 12th, Karen Campbell disappears, but she's literally walking in a hotel between the lift and her room, and she somehow disappears on this short walk. This is at the Wildwood Inn in Snowmass Village, and this shows just how quickly Ted can act in this really short amount of time he abducts someone. Her body was found a month later next to a dirt road just outside the resort and she'd been killed by very heavy blows to the head. On March 14th, ski instructor Julie Cunningham disappears while walking home from a dinner with a friend. Ted approaches her on crutches and asks for help carrying his ski boots to his car where he beats and handcuffs her before strangling her. And weeks later, he would actually drive the six hours just to visit her remains, but authorities would never find them themselves. Denise Oliverson disappeared from near the state border on April 6th whilst riding her bike to her parents' house. And then on May 6th, he killed 12-year-old Lynette Dawn Culver, who was potentially his youngest victim yet. He somehow lured her out of the school grounds before drowning her in a bathtub and then sexually assaulting her in his hotel room. He disposed of her body in a river, but her body has never been found. It's worth saying though that the authorities aren't entirely convinced that he killed Lynette. He confessed to it, but they never found a body and they just don't think it matches his usual MO. June 28th, Susan Curtis disappears from Brigham Young University campus, which would later actually become his very last confession. He confessed to this just moments before he died. Whilst these murders are happening around Utah and Colorado, Oregon and Washington are still trying to figure out the murders that happened there. They compile a database, which whilst is very much the norm today, back in the 1970s, this was huge. This was brand new technology. They had to use the King County payroll computer, the only computer available to them in the area. And they inputted all these different lists that they'd complied. These lists were things like people with the first name Ted, people who owned a Volkswagen Beetle, people who were the right age, known sex offenders, all of these different lists. They inputted them and waited for the computer to figure out common names in the lists. 26 different names turned up on four separate lists and Ted Bundy was one of these names. And whilst this was going on, detectives were also manually compiling a list of the 100 best suspects and Ted was on that one too. Washington were getting really close. I mean, if they just listened to Elizabeth's call anyway, they would have had it, but they were still working it out. But at the same time, on August 16th, 1975, Ted Bundy is finally arrested. He's in Granger, which is a Salt Lake City suburb, when an officer actually spots him just cruising around the neighborhood. And the officer knows that this, this is really weird. And then after spotting the patrol car, Ted Bundy makes a mistake and he speeds off at full speed and he turns his car lights off and the officer's obviously like, well, he's up to something no good because he's just seen the police car and he's off. So the police officer follows him. He pulls him over as part of a routine traffic stop and notices that the front passenger seat is actually on the back seat, which is weird. This officer then searches the car and finds a ski mask, a second mask made from pantyhose, a crowbar, handcuffs, bin bags, a coil of rope, an ice pick, and other burglary items. Now at this point, I don't know if the officer knew he had a murderer, but he knew he had somebody who was up to no good. 
But Ted argued, Ted was like, it's not illegal to own any of these items, they're just things. He says that the ski mask he used for skiing and the handcuffs he'd found just behind a dumpster and the rest were just standard everyday items. He tries to talk himself out of it, but of course the officer's not having any of it. And he actually arrests him on suspicion of burglary. Police compared the items found in Ted's car to the items that Carol Durant described seeing in her abductor's car. And they were pretty much the same. The handcuffs were the same style that Carol's abductor used. It was just too much of a coincidence, so authorities searched Ted's apartment. In his apartment, they find a guide to Colorado ski resorts, marking the Wildwood Inn. They find a brochure advertising the high school play that Deborah Kemp was in. Things were looking bad. Ted actually said that the searchers missed a collection of Polaroid photos which showed all of his victims' dead bodies. If they'd found these, the game would have been up, but they didn't. Ted said that as soon as he got back from the police station, he burnt these photos. The authorities didn't have enough to hold Ted at this point, and so they had to release him. All the evidence they had was circumstantial at best, but they placed him under 24-hour surveillance. And Detective Jerry Thompson, who was on the case, immediately flies to Seattle to interview Elizabeth, who tells them everything strange he's picked up on over the years. Finally, the police have got something. In September, Ted actually sells his car, his Volkswagen Beetle, to a teenager, but the police obviously seize it and impound it. And the FBI technicians start to dismantle and search. And they actually find hairs. They find hairs from Karen Campbell, Melissa Smith, and Carol Duranch. On October 2nd, Carol's called into the police station and she's asked to pick her attacker out of a lineup. She immediately picks Ted Bundy and the police charge him with attempted kidnapping. In the same lineup, they had a witness from the high school identify him as well and they felt confident that they had this man responsible. They had the man responsible for all of the murders. But they didn't have enough yet to charge him with murder, but they did charge him with aggravated kidnapping and attempted criminal assault on Carol Durant. He's freed on bail, his parents paid $15,000, and he spends as much time up to his court case as he can, living in Seattle with Elizabeth, who was still happily with him. He stands trial for Carol Dornch's kidnapping on February 23rd, 1976, and he actually waives his right to a trial due to all of the negative publicity, so he goes for a bench trial instead, meaning that just a judge is deciding whether he's guilty or not. Um, on March 1st, the judge actually finds him guilty of kidnapping and assault, and in June, he's sentenced to a minimum of one to a maximum of 10 years in jail. In the October, he's found hiding in the Utah State Prison Yard with an escape kit and is sent to solitary confinement for several weeks. Now, the Colorado authorities weren't satisfied with the outcome of his trial. They believed they had enough to charge him with the murder of Karen Campbell. So they officially filed charges on 22nd of October, 1976. And he's transferred to Glenwood Springs in Colorado in April, 1976 for the trial. Now at this trial, Ted actually elects to serve as his own attorney. Imagine that level of arrogance, thinking because you did a couple of terms at law school, you could serve as your own attorney in a murder trial. That's just a small peek into the madness of Ted Bundy's mind, I think. But because of the fact that he was acting as his own lawyer, he was excused from the judge from wearing leg shackles and handcuffs, and he was also free to visit the law library to research his case. On June 7th, he's at the courthouse law library where he's concealed from the guard's view, hidden behind a bookcase. He opens up a window and jumps from the second story, spraining his ankle as he lands. He strips off his outer layer of clothing and he just begins to walk. Police noticed he was gone almost immediately and set up cordons and roadblocks all around Aspen, but it was already too late. Ted was walking towards the mountains. As he reached the top of the mountain, he breaks into a hunting lodge and he steals food and warm clothes and a rifle. He then wanders aimlessly throughout the mountains for the next few days, where he's breaking into tents and things for food. Eventually, he wanders back into Aspen. Now, I don't know whether this was intentional, if he wanted to go back to Aspen, or he just got disorientated in the mountains for so many days. But he steals a car and attempts to drive out, only he drives towards the police checks, the roadblocks, and immediately does a U-turn and speeds away, and the police are like, well, that's our guy, the guy who doesn't want to go through the road checks. And so they chase him and arrest him. Inside the car, they find maps of the mountains, which suggest that Ted hadn't just spontaneously done this. He had planned this out. So Ted goes back to jail. And what you might not expect to hear is that the state's case against him 
was actually unravelling. It wasn't going the way they wanted it to go and it was really, really weak. Significant pieces of evidence that definitely would have put him away were being ruled as inadmissible and if Ted had stuck it out there was a huge chance that he would get acquitted. He accumulates about $500 which was most likely smuggled to him by Carol and Boone. He gets hold of a hacksaw blade and a detailed floor plan of the jail which he sort of got off other inmates and he gets to work. He saws a one foot square hole in the ceiling which he can then conceal and he loses about £35. He makes several practice runs over the coming weeks and despite a lot of people reporting that they can hear somebody moving around on the ceiling, none of the guards actually look into it. And then on December 30th, which is a notoriously quiet night in prisons with most of the staff off on Christmas break and the non-violent offenders off home on furlough, Ted does his escape. He crawls up through the hole in the ceiling and he actually breaks in to a guard's apartment. He climbs down through the ceiling, gets changed into street clothes, opens the door and just walks to freedom and he'd actually placed in his bed a load of books and files to make it look like he was still sleeping in there. Nobody realised he was gone for 17 hours. He steals a car and drives eastward out of Glenwood Springs but his car actually breaks down in the mountains and so he flags down a motorist to give him a lift. He gets a lift to Vail where he then catches a bus to Denver where he catches a flight to Chicago. I mean, by today's standards, it's shocking that he could board a flight and nothing flag up. I mean, I don't know if domestic flights in the 70s even required so much as an ID. Once he's in Chicago, he boards a train to Michigan where he spends about five days and then he steals a car, drives down to Atlanta, where he then boards a bus to Tallahassee, Florida. He arrives in Tallahassee on January 8th where he rents a room under the name Chris Hagen. This could have been the perfect opportunity for Ted to start anew with a new identity. He could have got a job and flown under the radar for years. Police wouldn't have thought to look in Tallahassee, Florida. As long as he didn't attract the attention of police, he most likely would have been able to fly under the radar for many, many years. And according to Ted, this is originally what he intended to do. But he couldn't get a job without producing ID and so he resorted to his old habits of shoplifting and stealing people's credit cards. Ted's new lifestyle lasted just a matter of days. On January 15th, 1978, he breaks into Florida State University's Chi Omega sorority house through the back door at 2.45 a.m. And he bludgeons and strangles two girls, Margaret Bowman and Lisa Levy. The attack on Lisa was so violent, they actually tears her nipple off and makes a very significant bite mark in her left buttock. And he sexually assaulted her with a hair mist bottle. He then beats two other girls with a log, but they both manage to survive. They survive thanks to their roommate, who arrived home about 3 a.m. and interrupted Ted. As the roommate Nina walks into the house, she can hear something happening upstairs and Ted can hear something happening downstairs. So Nina walks back and hides in the shadow and watches as Ted Bundy walks down the stairs and out of the house, holding a log. The killer struck first at the Chi Omega sorority house. He clubbed and then strangled to death 20-year-old Lisa Levy and 21-year-old Margaret Bowman. At least one of them was raped. The killer came in from the night and then returned to it with an ease that has so far baffled police and left most co-eds here terrified. But Ted didn't stop there. The sorority house just didn't quell his cravings. And so he breaks into the apartment of student Cheryl Thomas, who lived about eight blocks away. He dislocates her shoulder and fractures her skull and jaw in multiple places. She survived, but it ended her dance career. It's then a few weeks before his next attack. He steals a Florida State University van and drives 150 miles away to Jacksonville, where he approaches a 14-year-old and introduces himself as Richard Burton from the fire department. But luckily, the 14-year-old's brother actually comes over and confronts Ted Bundy, says, what are you doing? and Ted runs away. He then drives to Lake City and the following morning, 12-year-old Kimberly Leach goes missing. She's at school and she's called back to homeroom because she's left her purse in there. And on this short walk, Ted Bundy takes her. Her body is found seven weeks later in a shed in the Suwannee River State Park. One of the, the final uh, murders that you committed, of course, uh, was apparently little Kimberly Leach, 12 years of age. Uh, I think the, the public outcry is greater there because an innocent child was taken from a, from a playground. What did you feel after that? What was there, were there the normal emotions three days later? Where were you, Ted? I, uh, I can't really talk about that. 
right now. Just after this, on February 10th, Ted Bundy is officially added to the FBI's top 10 fugitives list. He loved this notoriety. He wore it as a badge of honour. By February 12th, Ted knows that the police are closing in on him, so he steals a car, another Volkswagen Beetle, and attempts to flee. He drives across the Florida Panhandle. Three days later, in Pensacola, near the Alabama state line, an officer actually stops him after running his plates and seeing that the car is stolen. As the officer tries to arrest Ted, Ted puts up a fight, kicks out the officer's legs from under him, and he runs. The officer fires a warning shot, and then tackles Ted Bundy to the ground. He arrests him on charges of resisting arrest and assaulting a police officer. Now in Ted's car, they actually found three sets of Florida State University student IDs and 21 stolen credit cards and also a stolen TV set. And the officer takes him to the station and at this point they don't realize they've got a fugitive on their hands. They just think they've got this guy who's up to something weird. And Ted says in the back of the car, I wish you had killed me. He spends the next five months in Tallahassee jail pending his hearing. On July 28th, 1978, he's indicted for the Chai Omega murders. He actually tears up the indictment and screams, that's all you're going to get, an indictment. And then two hours later, after pleading not guilty to these murders, he's charged with the kidnapping and murder of Kimberly Leach. In June of 1979, the Chai Omega murder trial actually had to be moved to Miami because they couldn't find an impartial jury in Tallahassee. And this trial was to be the first ever televised nationally in the USA. It was a huge case. They had reporters from over 250 different countries at the trial. And although Ted had five attorneys for this court case, he actually took charge of his own defense. Even in front of the entire world, in this huge, huge murder trial, Ted still had to be in control. A plea bargain is placed on the table in which Ted was to plead guilty to the murders of Lisa Levy and Margaret Bowman and Kimberly Leach in exchange for a 75 year sentence. No death sentence. And the prosecutors were pretty happy with this because their case against Ted, again, wasn't strong. The prospects of the prosecution losing a trial were very, very good. And at first, Ted was very happy with the deal. He was gonna take it. But when it actually came up to standing in front of the whole court and saying, the words guilty, he couldn't do it. He couldn't admit his guilt. The prosecution needn't have worried though because the evidence against Ted actually turned out to be pretty indisputable. They had testimony from Nina who saw Ted walking out of the house with the murder weapon. They had another sorority member called Connie who'd actually seen him hanging around the house earlier that evening. They had strong physical evidence in form of the bite on Lisa Levy's buttocks which perfectly matched the cast made of Ted's teeth. And they also had hairs of Ted Bundy found in Cheryl Thomas's house. The jury actually deliberated for less than seven hours before returning with the guilty verdict. And he was convicted on the 24th of July, 1979 of the murders of Margaret Bowman and Lisa Levy. Three counts of attempted murder and two counts of burglary. The judge imposed death sentences for both of the murder convictions, sending him to the electric chair. Six months later, a second trial takes place in Orlando for the abduction and murder of Kimberly Leach. And again, after just seven hours and 15 minutes of deliberation, he's found guilty again, and he's given a third death sentence. They had strong eyewitness evidence in this case of somebody who actually saw him leading Kimberly away from the school. Therefore, it is the sentence of this court as to count one of the indictment that you, Theodore Robert Bundy, be adjudicated guilty of murder in front in the first degree, and that you be sentenced to death for the murder of Kimberly Diane Beach. However, during the Kimberly Leach trial, Bundy actually marries Carol Ann Boone while she's on the stand. He's being questioned and she gets called up as a witness. And he says to her, do you want to marry me? She says yes. And under Florida state law, that's binding because they were in the presence of a judge. Carol, do you want to marry me? Yes. And I want to marry you? Yes. And I do want to marry you. <laughs> he said you do. He uses the loophole to his advantage, and so on February 9th, 1980, he's married. In October 1982, Carol Ann Boone actually gives birth to a daughter, Rose, and named Ted Bundy as the father. And there's conflicting stories as to how this came to be. Obviously, Ted Bundy wasn't allowed conjugal visits, um, but there were ways, and obviously, they made it work. Now, Carol was very much under Ted's spell and 100% believed him when he claimed his innocence. Like, 100% or doubt in her mind, he was innocent. And she stood as a character witness for him in court over and over and over again. But eventually, two years before his death, 
she stopped seeing him because he started to confess to murders and she couldn't tell herself that he was innocent anymore. She never spoke to him again, even ignoring his call on the day that he was going to die. She changed her name and a daughter's name and she's pretty much flown under the radar ever since. Now, Carol famously wasn't the only girl under Ted's spell, of course. He had his fangirls, his groupies, who would turn up to the courtroom in droves. And these fangirls are very much still around today. If you go on the internet and search for like Ted Bundy groupies, these girls are obsessed with him. Like they are in love with him and it is insane to me. Some thought he was innocent, he was too good looking to kill, too charming, too charismatic. But others did actually think he was guilty, but they were obsessed with him anyway. They loved his charm. A lot of people have claimed that when Ted said he was innocent, there was just something about him that made you 100% believe it. And obviously he didn't look like a serial killer, whatever a serial killer is supposed to look like. They would dye their hair dark and they would part their hair how his victims would have their hair parted. They would wear the same type of clothes and the same type of makeup. They almost wanted to be a Ted Bundy victim. They were emulating the kind of girl that he liked to kill. And even Ted was freaked out about this. He like wrote letters to Carol saying like, can you get these girls to stop because they're freaking me out. Imagine how creepy you've got to be to creep out a serial killer. Every time he turns around, I kind of get that feeling. No, no, you know, gonna get me next. But you're, yet you're fascinated by him. Very, very. Every night when I go to bed, I just, you know, I get very scared. I shut my door and lock him, you know. Try to imagine yourself in his place and to see how he's feeling, looking at the pillows, the blood stains, and everything. And if he really did it or not. Why do you do it? I don't know. <laughs> Robin Lloyd, Channel 4 News. Bundy spent nine years on death row before his execution took place. After his conviction for Kimberly Leach, obviously the whole appeals process began and this just went on for ages, but nothing was ever accepted. For years and years, he refused to admit to any of his crimes when he spoke about them. He'd speak about them in the third person to avoid the stigma of confession, so he said. Um, but he slowly over the years began to reveal more details of his crimes. He'd let small pieces of information go at a time and he'd use his confessions as a bargaining chip to delay his inevitable execution. I'm not holding you hostage. If you don't want to do anything with it, you're free to walk away. If you can put your heads together with these other law enforcement people and think of any way, I'm not asking for clemency. I'm not asking to get off. I'm not asking for sympathy, but I draw the line. We need a period of time, uh, 60, 90 days, systematically going over with everybody, bottom to top, everything I can think of, get it all down. You can use it as you see fit. I will not put myself in position of giving it all away and not getting the kind of result that I think is best for my people. And Bob, uh, they're gonna get me sooner or later. <laughs> you don't need to worry about that. But you've been after this for 15 years. A couple months is not gonna make any difference. A lot of the time he would imply that his killings began a long time before 1974, a long time before his first known victim. But then other times he'd backtrack on this and say that's not true. He would constantly change what he was saying and people wanted to know what the truth was. And so his execution did keep getting delayed. He spoke in interviews about how burglary was how he started out. He liked possessing things from other people. It's what he did when he was growing up and he liked having stolen things. This same theory applies to his need for rape and murder. He liked taking things from people without their permission, even their lives. He said the ultimate possession was in fact the taking of the life and then the physical possession of the remains. Like I said, he would go back and visit the remains weeks after their deaths. In July 1984, it actually seemed like he was trying to escape once again. They found hacksaws hidden in his cell. And when they looked closer, they found that the bars in his cell had actually been sawn off and they'd been stuck back on with glue. In October 1984, Bundy famously contacted Robert Keppel, who was in charge of the investigation into the Green River killings. Bundy offered to share his expertise into serial killers. He was sharing his insights into the psychology of a killer, as well as motivations and behavior of the killer. I personally think a little bit too much emphasis has been placed on Ted Bundy's assistance in catching the Green River killer, but there was one thing that seemed like he did say which was helpful. Ted suggested that the killer seemed like the kind of person who would go back and visit the remains in the week after. So he suggested to the police, if you find some remains, leave them and just watch. And sure enough, the killer did return. 
and I haven't looked into the Green River killings that much so I don't know the ins and outs of this case um I'm sure I'll get around to it eventually but it actually took the police another 12 years to arrest the killer Gary Ridgway which I really struggle to say Gary Ridgway um so I don't I do think a bit too much emphasis is placed on Ted Bundy's help here but famously he did help out Robert Keppel and Robert Keppel wrote an entire book about it some of your specific things about dump sites and obviously you might have some special knowledge that you think may assist us in that area well first of all he's trying to dispose of the bodies and they won't be found this guy doesn't want to get caught i think it's clear that over time you can see him at least it would appear that over time he's trying to improve his dump sites he's trying to get better at disposing of his bodies and i bet she's getting nervous he said, I'm going to start to find my bodies again, because just looking at how this unfolded, I see here in my dates that you found these first five really quickly. Coldfield, Chapman, and Hines, and Mills. You can see he changes. He's obviously not going to use that Green River anymore, at least not for a while. And um, he's looking for something that's more effective, so he goes back to dry land uh, with number six. In early 1986, an execution date is actually set for the Chai Omega murders, and this was to be on March 4th but it's quickly rescheduled to July the 2nd. Um, and in April, after this new date is set for July, Ted actually begins to confess to a whole wide range of murders. He'd give them details about what he'd do to his victims after their deaths, how he would revisit the crime scenes until the decomposition set in, he would apply makeup to their faces, all of this stuff that I've talked about in this. Ted started saying just before he was due to be executed. It was his bargaining chip. Over the next couple of years, the execution date is set multiple times and it's always delayed. And it was actually only delayed 15 hours before his date that was set in July. And that's because there was actually doubt set on the evidence in the Chai Omega murders. They were trying to say that he was actually very mentally ill and therefore he shouldn't have been allowed to stand trial in the way that he did. Um, which, of course, did cancel this particular execution date, but it didn't delay it forever. It did happen eventually. Every time a new execution date was set, Ted would just confess to another crime, lengthening his life, and the authorities were stuck between a rock and a hard place. Do they find these missing bodies? Do they bring peace to the family? Do they find out the details? Or do they just end it and let him die? Eventually a firm date was set for 24th of January 1989. This was for the murder of Kimberly Leach because they still couldn't agree on the discrepancies in the Chai Omega case. And Ted at this point had no further reason to deny any of his crimes. And so it seemed he spoke quite frankly with investigators. Seemingly he confessed to all eight of the Washington and Oregon murders in which he was a prime suspect. And he even confessed to other murders in which he hasn't been suspected at all. Um, but again, you've got to bear in mind this was Ted Bundy and nobody could really figure him out. Was he telling the truth for all of this? We'll never really know. He said he incinerated Donna Manson's head in Elizabeth's fireplace and said, of all the things I did to her, this is probably the one she's least likely to forgive me for. Poor Liz. He described how he abducted George Ann Hawkins and she actually came round in the car after he'd beaten her around the head with the crowbar. She came round and she was like, confused but lucid and she thought that he was taking to help her for her Spanish test the next day and he said that this was really difficult for him because he was never used to like having his victims alive in the car and talking to him so he just hit her around the head again and knocked her out. He also said in the George Ann Hawkins case that he actually returned to the spot where he'd abducted her the very next day which was crawling with the police at this point and he just casually strolled in and picked up some earrings off the floor that had fallen out of her ears, picked up a shoe which had fallen off and just walked away again and nobody saw anything it was brazen. So I thought it was there but it wasn't. So I went back, this was the next day, got on my bicycle, rode back to that little parking lot. I knew there were police all over the place by that time, but I was kind of nervous because, and I'll tell you why in a minute. So I went back to that parking lot and I found the pierced earrings and the shoe laying in the parking lot at about five in the afternoon. So I surreptitiously gathered them up and rode off. After the police had checked that area? Well, you can tell me. I've seen whole streams of them driving around all over the place. They couldn't have looked in the parking lot and missed the white pant leather clog and the two white pierced earrings. Who were hoops. The reason that I was so nervous about anything like that being found in that parking lot was 
that no more than two weeks before, I have been using the same modus operandi in the same neighborhood. He spoke about his crimes like he was proud of them. They were a badge of honor. It was the biggest accomplishment in his life. He liked to have complete and utter control over these girls. It was part of his God complex. Bundy had hundreds of interview requests, everyone wanting to be the very last person to interview him before he was executed. And he declined all requests apart from one. This was Dr. James Dobson, who was founder of an evangelical Christian charity called Focus on the Family. He was a psychologist. He was just like full on Christian man. And James Dobson goes to interview him and it puts a whole brand new spin on the murders, a spin that nobody had ever heard of before. Ted begins to blame all of his actions on pornography. He said that he started off with soft pornography and it gradually got worse and worse and worse before the only way he could like satisfy his cravings was to actually live out his fantasies for real and murder and rape these women. He told this evangelical Christian exactly what he wanted to hear. He was still playing with people right up until his last moment. And the church was using Ted to push their agenda, their anti-pornography agenda. And Ted, weirdly enough, was more than happy to comply with this. He knew what he was doing. You really feel that hardcore pornography and the doorway to it, softcore pornography, is doing untold damage to other people and causing other women to be abused and killed the way you did others. Listen, I'm no social scientist and I haven't done a survey. I mean, I, I don't pretend that I know what John Q. Citizen thinks about this. <clears throat> but I've lived in prison for a long time now. And I've met a lot of men who were motivated to commit violence just like me. And without exception, every one of them was deeply involved in pornography without question, without exception, deeply influenced and consumed by an addiction to pornography. Do I think pornography was solely to blame for Ted Bundy's actions? No, his actions came from something a lot deeper, something rooted within him. At most, pornography would have been a trigger, but this need was always in him. By placing the blame on porn, Ted is absolving himself of all personal blame for his actions. It wasn't his fault, it was porn's fault. For Ted, it was always somebody else's fault, it was never his fault. If it wasn't porn, it was his grandfather's abuse, but he always said that he respected his grandfather. It's the fact that he never knew the truth about his parentage, his mother lied to him, he didn't have a good childhood. It was always somebody else's fault he never ever took any blame for himself. I don't think for one second he ever truly understood the consequences of what he had done. He was so self-absorbed, so arrogant, that he thought the only person who mattered was him. Everyone else was simply a plaything to make his life better. He truly thought he was indestructible up until the moment that he actually died. Ted conceived of himself, as he told me, as being 99% normal and just having this little sliver where he liked to go out and bash girls over the head. Rather than being tormented by the evil, as it were, of what he had done, he was more likely to be tormented by the inability to satisfy, as frequently perhaps as he desired, the, the needs of that condition that dwelled within him. Bundy dies in the electric chair at 7.16am on January 24th, 1989, at 42 years old. People outside the prison cheered as the execution was carried out, whilst others cried. His body was cremated and his ashes were actually spread in the Cascade Mountains in Washington, around the same area where he disposed of so many of his victims' bodies. This just seems like it was Ted's last fuck you to the world. I'm gonna put in my will that I'm gonna be scattered where most of my victims were buried and you can't do anything about it because it's my last and final will. Ted Bundy is such a fascinating case because he seems so different from all other serial killers. Someone so arrogant that they thought they could defend themselves and murder trial. Someone who thought they were completely, completely indestructible. He didn't believe that eyewitnesses were ever telling the truth in court. He didn't believe when they said they'd seen him because he thought that nobody paid attention to anybody else. He thought he was abducting girls off the streets and nobody was paying any attention to him. He genuinely believed that. And he couldn't believe it in court when everyone was coming forward saying like, no, I saw you, you were there, you were wearing a sling, you were wearing crutches, you had your leg in a cast. I think in most serial killers, or at least most of the ones I've covered in this series anyway, there's usually a clear breaking point. I mean, Eileen Warnos was raped repeatedly as a child. John Wayne Gacy was abused by his father for years and years, always told that he wasn't good enough. 
you have Richard Ramirez, I mean, he didn't stand a chance when you look at his childhood. And not that that excuses any actions, but at least you can see a clear turning point. You can see something which led them to where they ended up. Ted Bundy? I fail to see that. I mean, his grandfather was abusive, but Ted Bundy said that he loved his grandfather very, very much. And yeah, maybe he didn't know who his real parents were for a long time, but a lot of people have that. A lot of people have strange, messed up families. It doesn't lead them to go on to become a serial killer. Stephanie Brooks woke up with him and broke his heart. That happens to a lot of people as well. Him and Jeffrey Dahmer are possibly the only people I've looked at so far that I would say they just had this in them from birth. Something in their brains which made them have this compulsive need to murder. Ted spoke so little about his early life, his early murders, that we don't actually know much about them. How did his violence start? How does a person break down those barriers of morality in the way that he did it? How do you separate yourself from the victim so much? He would repeatedly justify his murders. He believed that everyone was just out to get him. The night before his execution, he confessed to 30 homicides, but we'll never know the true total. It could be as high as 100, as a lot of people suspect. That's a rumour that Bundy would regularly fuel, but never actually confirm. And that is everything I have for you in this week's video, and I'd love to hear what you guys think about this. Do you think this was always in Ted Bundy? Do you think, no matter what, he was always going to go on to be a murderer? Do you think there was a turning point? Do you think there was something that happened in his childhood that he never really shared? I can't wait to hear what you all think and just before I end this really quick I want to talk about Patreon. I have recently, as in literally today, opened up a Patreon page. I'll link it in the first line of the description down below. Um, no pressure, if you don't want to go look you don't have to, all of the details will be on the page. Um, but if you would like to support me on Patreon, that would be just incredible. I love doing true crime on YouTube, I love doing these videos, but the reality is that pretty much all of my videos get demonetized immediately. And I don't know how much longer I'm going to be able to keep on doing what I'm doing without having a little support. I'm taking the plunge, I'm just going to do it. If you do want to support me, then that will be down below and thank you so much. And even if you just want to support me by clicking that subscribe button and giving this video a thumbs up, that would be amazing as well. This video is going to get demonetized straight away, I can tell you that for nothing. But a thumbs up will help push it in the algorithm and just views, just views are always great. All I want to do is to be able to push myself and provide the best possible content I can for you guys. So any way you can support me by following me on social media, subscribing to me on here, supporting my Patreon, buying my pins, it is all so, so appreciated. And thank you so much for watching. Bye guys.